this is Jason Spangler, the Santee Swapper with Scouting Hot Finds Radio. My guest today is Mitch Reese. I'm sure that many collectors will recognize Mitch as a veteran dealer in the hobby, but Mitch is also an author, and so he has just updated one of his most prolific books that people know about, The Guide to Dating and Identifying Boy Scouts of America, Badges, Uniforms, and Insignia. This has been a years-long project for him, so I wanted to bring him on to kind of talk a little bit about his background, all the different books that he's done, but then also tell us about this new book. So, Mitch, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Jason. Let's just kind of go back. I know that a lot of people have done uh, deals with you, have read your books and stuff, but just to kind of catch people up on all the different books that you've authored, can you just briefly tell us about the books that you've done for the Boy Scout memorabilia hobby? Sure. I've actually written nine books on scouting history and memorabilia. My first book was written back in 1984. It was back in the days before personal computers and word processors and digital cameras. So it was all done with an old-fashioned typewriter, whiteout, and uh, black and white photography. It was a book on the Boy Scouts during World War One and World War Two. covered all the service projects that were involved, all the insignia, and all the fun project-type stuff that the Scouts got involved with during the First and Second World Wars. Everything from gardening to selling war bonds to collecting peach pits to use. There was something about a peach pit that when they burned it, it became there was a special type of charcoal in there that they could use to uh, fill the gas mask. In 1996, I published a book, The History of the Lone Scouts Through Memorabilia. Again, covered history, covered all the awards and memorabilia, and all the way through the merger with the Boy Scouts and the alumni groups that formed after the merger. In 2005, I took a little different twist and wrote the, our, the history of the Connecticut Rivers Council that outlined the 23 councils that made it up at, up the current Connecticut Rivers Council and spent hundreds of hours going through microfilm at the town libraries, finding out about old camps that people never knew existed and events and stuff that the scouts were involved with. Uh, in 2006, I wrote a book called The History of the Boy Scouts of America Uniforms, and it spent a lot of time kind of covering the early manufacturers, people, companies like the Sigmund Eisner Company, the Swedor Company, and then went through and did a decade-by-decade decade review of how the uniforms changed over the years for the Boy Scouts, Sea Scout, Explorer, Air Scout, Cub Scouts, and the like. So, Mitch, that's today. I, I think I have most of those in my library, and uh, I might, if I don't, I might hit you up for a couple of them, but I think I do. I know the World War uh, one I definitely have. So, today we're focusing on the guide to identifying BSA badges, uniforms, and insignia, and I wonder if you can kind of take us back to this project when you started. You know, this is really kind of an encyclopedia, and you've already mentioned some of the research you've done with libraries and microfilm and everything else. So when did you start building this original book, and uh, what was it back then? Yep. The book started in 1988. It was it originally was a 40-page pages of my notes that I started putting together by doing a bunch of research and just trying to understand oh, how old is this thing that I just picked up at a flea market? Back when I was writing back in 1988, there were a couple books on the Order of the Arrow stuff, one uh, a couple on CSP, but there was very, very little on uh, Boy Scout insignia and memorabilia, and it was before the Internet even really existed. So I the, the focus of, this, of my books was always to help collectors date and identify Boy Scout of America badges, uniforms, and insignia. When there was a more detailed book out there, like uh, one that Paul Myers wrote on Boy Scout rank or Jim Clough did on exploring, I would cross-reference it. And I really focused more on the dateable changes of stuff, not necessarily every single variety. So if there were badges that we looked at and hey, okay, it, the knot use on a light patch was yellow and then changed to red. We knew, or I'm sorry, we went from red to yellow. We knew what year that was. We could date it, but not necessarily every minor little change on there. And again, one of the other focuses I always 
felt strongly on the book is it's not a pricing guide. Prices change over time. What I try to do is teach the history. So again, in 1988, we wrote the first copy of it. It was all uh, text. The pictures were all clip art. 1991, I did the second edition. We, at that point, we we're up like 67 pages. That was the old pink cover book. And then in 2000, I did a huge rewrite of it. It was back then you could get uh, flatbed scanners to do work. Yeah, I mean, I paid over $2,000 for a flatbed scanner so I could actually take images or pitch photographs of the, the images or scans of the images and be able to customize them to be able to get really sharp black and white pictures. In 2009, we did our rewrote the book again. So that was our fourth edition. Now had a white cover, went from the yellow cover of the 2000 to the white cover and started adding things like Cub Scouting and a whole lot of additional adult insignia. We were up to like 250 pages at the time. And just recently, the book will have a full color cover. Unfortunately, to do the whole book in color would have been way too cost prohibited. And it's basically everything that's changed over the last 11 years in scouting, which was huge. I mean, the Cub Scouting program was all redone. The varsities cha- varsity scouting, venture scouting, bringing girls into the program. So the new book is 320 pages. And I sat down and counted the other day. There were over 1,800 photographs and images in the book. Wow, I can't wait to get a copy. In fact, I've already paid like a lot of people. And at the end of this interview, we'll kind of tell people how they can do that. But, you know, uh, Mitch, I went to school got a history degree, so I'm really kind of curious about all of this uh, primary and maybe secondary sources that you use. You know, how did you really go back and research this? It's not like in the library there's just, you know, a a section you go to, the Dewey Dewey Decimal System, where it's like Boy Scout history. How did you put all this together? I'm lucky. I have a excessive Scout history library that I've put together over the years, and I pulled information from all types of different sources. I literally spent thousands of hours going through all of the old Boy Scout equipment catalogs, Boy's Life magazines, scouting magazines, the annual reports to Congress, which typically had a, a section from the Uniform and Insignia Committee, old insignia control guides, pricing lists, supply catalogs, Hamburg, the old diaries. So it was really uh, piecing all that type of stuff together, all these different places, trying to fill holes. And what it came down to a lot of times is, okay, when did the badge, this badge start? So you'd look in a, see, it was listed in a, in a 1918 catalog. Nope. Was it listed in a 24 catalog? Nope. Was it listed in 28? Oh, yes. So now do you have anything between 24 and 28 that you can use to try to narrow it down? Okay, that's the, we found it in was it wasn't in 25 was in 26. Okay, it started in 26 or close to it. Uh, the one thing I want to mention up in front is when you're trying to date stuff, the best you can try to do is get the stuff within a couple year period. Publications were off, listings were off at times. They, they announced something and they may not have brought it right in. So you really had to, to kind of look at it is hey, can we bring this thing down to within a few years? And then, okay, you know it started in uh, 26. Let me then go see, okay, is it in 30, 32? Is it in 36? Is it in 40? And eventually say, okay, nope, they changed it. They got rid of it then. So now you start having a range. Well, it sounds like a real detective job to trace these things down. But I understand exactly what you're talking about with estimating the changes. I did a PowerPoint not long ago on the digital Cracker Barrel for senior scouting memorabilia. And one of the caveats I said right up front is don't quote my date because in some references it might say this happened in 1960 and some it says 61 and some says 59. And, you know, like you said, there's a date that they announced something and then there's a date that maybe it goes into effect. So there's kind of a range there. Um, Mitch, one area that I've always kind of struggled with is some of this teens era stuff. For example, I collect merit badges, and I know, for example, in the merit badge book, there's a bunch of stuff about teens era merit badges where there's little slight pages, and there's, you know, five different versions of this one merit badge in the teens. 
So it does seem to me like it's really hard to know how uh, back in that period of time, if you're going back now almost 100 years, you know, when things were issued and, and really, you know, being accurate, how, how have you kind of dealt with that, with the inconsistencies in manufacturers and all the other issues when the, the first 10 years, the Boy Scouts? A lot of that comes down to, again, the focus on my book is to try to help you date and identify things. It does not go into every single little minor variation. Back in the teens, the documentation was actually fairly good, but it was all artist drawings. So you're not going to be able to see on a mirror badge, for example, if the if it had the thumb sticking up or the thumb sticking down on a physical or a fist, tight fist on a physical development merit badge, per se. You're not going to know, see, was it more of an orangey color or more of a pinky color? <laughs> that type of stuff, there's, it's almost impossible to, to come down to an exact time date. But back in those days, the documentation was pretty good. So if you're looking to see what year a citrus fruit culture merit badge came out or what year a uh, the camping merit badge was first used, that is normally fairly well, was fairly well documented. You had, again, the equipment catalogs back then were fairly specific. You had uh, handbooks were fairly good from that standpoint. So, and you might be able to see some pictures in some of the old Boy Scout diaries. And you, again, you don't, can't necessarily pick out every variety, but you can see the major stuff. It was so it was fairly easy to tell from the descriptions and the stuff what existed back then, because unlike the equipment catalogs that they they had out in the fifties that would have you're lucky to see any you didn't see any rank in them normally and you'd only see limited insignia and a lot of pictures of all the the knives and the first aid kits and the race car sets and anything else that the Boy Scouts wanted to sell. The early equipment catalogs had catalog numbers for almost every single thing that they sold. So there was a lot of detail back there. But again, a lot of it wasn't, some of it wasn't photographed or very few, little in the teens, nothing was actually photographed. You had artist drawings for it and if they made a change to the badge, did they go back and rechange the artist drawing is a whole different story. Well, thanks for explaining that. I say this is one reason why I wanted to get you on the podcast is so I can ask you questions and learn things. And uh, that was always something that kind of bothered me. Uh, you know, I'm looking here at the table of contents of your book. I've got the fourth edition on my desk. And, you know, you, you cover all these topics from Air Scouts, Sea Scouts, Merit Badges, uniforms, everything. So I was kind of curious, you know, what is kind of the most challenging topic when it comes to identifying these badges that you have kind of tackled? I would say one of the challenges that comes in trying to date a uniform always is what I call leftovers. Older insignia put onto a newer uniform. Sometimes that was done because of a family member had something, so it's not uncommon to have a newer uniform where he was wearing his dad's or his uncle's eagle medal on it. But more so, it was what I call, it was council leftovers. They, council didn't throw out the badges that they had. A story I can remember was, and I remember running into a guy at one of the scout shops one day, and they had a whole bunch of 1960s twill merit badges sitting out there. And the guy was scoffing them up like crazy. It says, and that was back when the collectors, it wasn't that old a badge, so the collectors weren't really going after it back then. But this guy, Scoutmaster was grabbing them. I go, why are you grabbing them? He says, why should I spend a dollar, over a dollar for a merit badge when I can get these older ones for 10 cents a piece and give them to the kids? So that means somewhere out there, there was a bunch of 1990 uniforms <laughs> running around merit badge stashes with 1960s first aid badges or uh, camping badges on it because he got them at a good price. So that's one. That's always a challenge when you're picking up the stuff in looking for consistency. 
Well, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I am absolutely guilty of that sin. And I'll, I'll tell you that just yesterday, one of the members of my troops leadership was here at my warehouse. And she went through and picked out 88 plastic fax merit badges that are going to be handed out at a court of honor very soon. But none of them have this Scouts BSA logo stuff. All of them are probably 1980s or earlier. They're still the, the current design, but if someone picks up this sash, you know, 50 years from now, it's not going to match, you know, the time period. So I am very guilty of doing the exact same thing that Scoutmaster did. Yep. Again, it happens all the time. Well, you told me over the phone earlier when we were talking that part of your challenge for this fifth edition has been that the last decade or so of items for this book was just incredibly difficult to to track down. Can you kind of share with us what your research found? Why was it so hard to to catch up from the last yeah. book, 2009. Yeah. yeah. I mean, luckily I had kept track of some stuff that was happening, knowing that eventually I was going to do another edition of the book. It just ended up taking a lot longer than I expected. But the real challenge came in starting in 2006 when they stopped putting out regular equipment catalogs. And the Boy Scouts started to replace the regular catalogs with the BSA Supply website. Fantastic. Here's pitch, color pictures of everything other than the website has no history to it. So you don't know when something first appears or when it was removed other than it, is it on the website today? Is it not on the website today? And if you, again, it's either here or, or gone. And on the website, they started to leave leftover stuff really, really bad because they want to sell everything they have. So you can find stuff out there that couldn't have been, had expired or couldn't have been earned for a number of years, but they're still selling it on the website. The other challenges you start to run into is, again, with the newer stuff, the uniform, for example, has changed so many times over just the last few years. And at the same time, the way they list things don't match up. So you'll find it listed as a uh, stretch poplin material or a microfiber, special microfiber. And then if, when you actually go pick up the shirt in the scout shop and you look at the label, it might be 100% polyester or polyester cotton. And so they advertise it on the website one way, but the actual what's actually there is very different. So trying to cross-reference these things and try to understand what is it. The shirts have been, they use nylon blends, they use polyester blends, they use cotton blends recently, where over years ago, the shirt was pretty much you either got a cotton shirt or you got a cotton polyester shirt, or if you really had some money, you could buy a wool blend type of thing. But it wasn't, and that stuff was all documented, where now it's just, it's a challenge. It was trying to piece it all together and come up with the best of what you can when you don't have those starting points. One of the things I've tried to do, and I, I've been doing this for the last 10 years since they did the website, but I obviously didn't do it as much as I should have, is to go out on a regular basis and try to look for something that might be new or may not have been there before. But again, that always becomes a challenge because they don't always mark it. One trick that we did learn, and I do describe it in the book under a clues section, is there is a SKU number or a catalog number got redone a number of years ago. And as new stuff comes in, it tended, has a tendency to have a new or higher SKU number than, than earlier stuff. And by doing a lot of research, we were able to narrow down some skew ranges for at least the newer things so you could tell what year over the last 10 years it was most likely issued in, which is, again, a huge clue when you're, you're trying to look for stuff because a lot of the badges will have a skew number attached to them, but again, but based on that number, you can sometimes tell. Now, it doesn't work for things where they've changed the badge design, but they kept the same SKU number as a previous piece. But 
again, between that and backings and some other clues, there, there are other ways that you can try to narrow it down to try to see what's going on. But again, it still doesn't deal with leftover problem. When you were telling that story, it just reminded me of these switchback pants that they've had the last maybe couple decades now. And I've been pretty active in scouting, and I can't tell you how many times I think they've changed the style or done something or added a zipper at the bottom. And, you know, it just seems like they're constantly tweaking and playing with the pants because they never quite got them right. So that's just a, a sign of what you're talking about. Mitch, you know, I think that your book, you've said it's over 300 pages coming out. It really is just has an incredible breadth of what it covers. And I'm wondering is now we're kind of getting towards talking about the new book, if you could just kind of tell the listeners some of the areas that this book covers, because I think it's really going to be a, one that almost every collector should go out and purchase. Sure. Uh, again, I, as Jason mentioned, the new book now has three over 320 pages, over 1,800 pictures and images. And almost all the sections were expanded. Many additional photos were done. So even if you have my fourth edition, this one has so much more info in it than you had before. I mean, there's everything from Cub Scout, Boy Scout, all the senior scout programs that were in there, uh, just as a Quick rundown. I mean, I start off with a program summary. What are were all these programs over the years? I have a whole section on clues, the clues to help you tell labels and manufacturers and seals and pin types. And again, those catalog numbers or SKU numbers that can help you try to near, date something or bring it down to give you an idea of where you're going. There's a section on the Boy Scout or now Scouts BSA uniforms, all the new girl stuff that's in there, Cub Scouting, the Den Mothers and women's uniforms, Sea Scouts, Sea Explorers, Air Scout, Air Explorers, Venturing, Varsity, Rover Scouting, Patrol Medallions or Patrol Identification, not just the medallions, the old Patrol Ribbons and what colors were used for what patrols and alike. A section on Boy Scout and Scout BSA, the rank and all their position patches, Cub Scout rank and positions, merit badges. All the different merit badges are list, are shown. There's photographs of every single one of them, and it, it talks about the different types of cloth at a high level, not down to some of the super minute details that some people are starting to play with, but it goes, okay, it was Square badges were used during these years, the wide crimp, the, the crimp badge, and then trying to show you major design changes and when they were done. So when did the arm mechanics merit badge change from a uh, tractor with a roll bar on it versus one without a roll bar and those types of changes that we could actually document and try to try to date in there. There's Air Scout, Air Exploring, Regular Exploring, Senior Scouting, Rover Scout Insignia, a bunch on Sea Scout and Sea Exploring Insignia. I added a whole new section on all the special interest stuff, trying to realize how many of the different uh, law enforcement exploring and what those ribbon bars were that were people were always saying, oh, what was this? type thing, along with the little minute changes in some of these patches. Some of them, they used, had the old Explorer E, but if you looked in the center, it was the, the little circle V design. And then they, at some point, they started putting a little first class or a little tenderfoot emblem in there instead of the circle V design. And then at one point, they started putting it out with a bar underneath the E. And then a little bit later, when they started all the special interest learning for life stuff, they took the Boy Scout emblem off, and they still had the emblem underneath it. So, again, there's a, there was a lot of research that went into that type of stuff. There's the old Venture and then bar, Venturing insignia, Varsity Scouting and Varsity Scouting insignia, Emergency Service Flooring type stuff. All Again, all this, the community and council patches, when did it go from – the khaki and red to the red and white type things. A huge section on all types of special awards. 
So it's the Life Saving Award, the National Level Award, Silver Beavers, Antelopes, and Buffaloes, and alike, uh, Hornaday, or the new Conservation Award that they've just announced to, to go into their uh, and training awards, contest medals, ribbon bars, watch bobs, service stripes and stars, all types of knots and what were the different knots over the years and veterans insignia. And then the biggest section of the book is all the adult office badges, trying to identify them, trying to identify when they've changed, trying to show, put a little history around some of them. So not just pictures and stuff, but when what was a the National Advisory Council, for example, or how did it change from an institutional rep to a scouting coordinator to a positions like that, how they've migrated over the years. So there's over 70 some odd pages of just that type of stuff, all the way through to a picture of the the new scout exec, or he's no longer a, a scout exec. He doesn't go by chief scout exec anymore. He goes by national president and CEO. So I actually was able to get a copy of his brand new patch, and there's one of those in the book. So again, we put so much more information in there trying to help identify the things so when it's changed. I've also, in some cases, started listing add pictures of some council specific stuff in uh or council specific office badges when we could identify them and also some of those unidentifiable stuff when you turn it over and it has a ESA 2010 back but nobody's heard the heard of the position before it's like okay what is some of that and at least to try to put it in there even though we can't document it or I can't find any written documentation on that it was definitely something that was made by supply and started putting some even some of that into the book my gosh it seems like there's an area there's just not much that hasn't been covered i've always thought that this is the kind of book that would appeal really to any adult in scouting regardless of whether or not they have the patch collecting bug or not like some of my listeners um, have you ever really seen that your book has been popular with a great range of scouters beyond just the thread heads and the cloth hounds? There's some. Again, and I've, as I keep enhancing it, I keep putting in more of that background information. The other book that has a lot of it, which I always call the companion book for this, that hopefully I'll be able to get back into print very soon, was the History of the Boy Scout Uniforms. That one was written more for the general scouter, and it doesn't go into the level of detail that the Badges Uniforms Insignia book did and did more of a decade-by-decade decade review of the uniforms, had a lot of history. Again, some of that history is here. That was also a kind of a companion book that was geared more for the wood badger, the scouter who wants stuff. But this book definitely has as information. So, I mean, and there's just, again, thousands of pictures that you can look at and you can see stuff that you had no idea on. But, and again, I tried to put in more and more of the history where I could of to, to do it. But again, a lot of it's really geared for the, the collector. I mean, that's the main focus on it. But anybody who wants to, you're, you're to want to put together a 75th anniversary uh, of your troop uh, presentation and you want to collect the stuff or you have an old uniform that somebody gave you. No, you may not be a crazy collector who wants to think, get every single variety of everything, but if you're looking at it, how do you put it? Well, I mean, how can you date it? And then also, people, I've seen too many times people taking a uniform and putting stuff on there that's just wrong for the time period because they don't know any better. And that's where this book can help you significantly so that if you're building a uniform up, you can make it look right. You're not going to put a ninth Eagle medal that they got rid of, they stopped producing in 1920 on with star and life patches that didn't come out until 26. <laughs> I mean, somebody 
piece this stuff together, what it probably had was that at one point the uniform might have had early teens star and life patches on, and somebody took them off and said, oh, well, let's replace them with these. But it's totally wrong <laughs> from a historian standpoint. So that's where this book can, can really help you. Well, Mitch, the new edition is almost ready from the publisher. Can you tell folks how they can order this book from you? Because I'm sure if they listen this long to the podcast, they're chomping at the bit. Yep. Uh, you can get the book. Again, I should have them ready to ship w about the second week in uh, March. So, I mean, less than 10 days, they should they should be here. And once I get them, the people that pre-ordered them, they'll start going out and we'll keep shipping them out as long as we can ha get them and, and go from there. Uh, you can pick them up on my, or you can get information on it on my website, which is MitchReese.com, M-I-T-C-H-R-E-I-S.com. You can send me an email, which is Mitch at MitchReese.com, or the easy one of the easy ways is to find me on Facebook Messenger. If you belong to any of the collector groups, you'll find there. Or just do a search on Mitch Reese and look for the one in Windsor, Connecticut. There's a uh, Mitch Reese ball player. There's a couple other down in Florida. There was there's some guy out in Chicago. So as uh, as I always thought, I had a very unique name. There, there's a handful of them out there, but I'm the only one in in Windsor, Connecticut, or in the Hartford, Connecticut area that that people know of. So if you just search search on there, try to send me a message on Facebook Messenger, and I'll be glad to to get back to you. Or again, you can just go out to Mitch at Mitch Reese dot com or just look on my website which is mitchreese.com again it's m-i-t-c-h-r-e-i-s dot com well mitch i'm sure that some of your work getting this fifth edition ready came during the pandemic and maybe some time during lockdown do you have any plans to write other books or update other titles that you have already issued before going forward my biggest plan right now is to get the rest of my books back into print I again, my Lone Scout book's out of print. My uniform book is out of print. My World War One, World War Two book is out of print right now. I used to have a printer, local printer that I used for 20 plus years. When I I would have them run a few hundred to start, and every time we got low, they would just push the button, and another 50 would come out. And there's some new owners took over, and they decided that that was no longer they would do it for me, but if I only wanted 50 of them, they didn't care that they had printed 1,500 of them for me over the years. They were going to jack the rate up three, four times what I was paying for them. So I couldn't even sell them at anywhere near the price that I was trying to, to sell the books for. Right now, I've been lucky enough to find somebody, another way to get these things printed where I can order smaller quantities so I don't have to sit on thousands of books sitting down my basement and not being able to put out a new edition because I still have tons of the old ones floating around. So that's my first thing is to get the other ones back into print. Other topics, I've I got a few ones that I've played with over the years. Uh, one of them that I'm seriously thinking of trying to do is something on the Boy Scout celluloid pinback buttons, but again, I'm not sure if there's enough interest in that topic to, to make it worthwhile to to do a book like that. That would be a book that would be a, it'd be a smaller book, so color and color would be pretty critical for that. So that's one that I've been batting around for a little bit, and we'll have to see. Well, Mitch, kind of wrapping things up, I want to say that you're probably – among a very small handful of people who have authored collecting guides for our hobby that are just critical to so many people getting interest in this hobby and keeping it going. And I wonder if you could just kind of share your thoughts on this. You know, why is it so important and vital for us to have reference books in a hobby that is built on collectibles? It's really tied to two types of things. Yeah, one is trying to share information. When I was writing my council history book, for example, one of the things, I mean, I'd start to try to reach out, and so much of that stuff 
was destroyed over the years or is hidden. I mean, as councils started merging, especially back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, nobody cared about the, or at least the council typically didn't care about those scrapbooks that were put together back in the 40s and 50s. So they just threw them out or somebody would grab them. But you had to try to be able to find that type of stuff. I mean, you'd set up an a find a get a name of an old timer. You call them up in beginning of December, and it's like, yeah, I'd love to get together and talk with you. Uh, give me a call at the beginning of the year. You call up at the beginning of the year. Oh, sorry, Joe died on December twentieth, and that history is all being lost. But the other thing is the more important thing is education. It amazes me how many people are willing to pay hundreds of dollars for an item. They won't spend $35 on a reference book or newsletter. And to give you an example how critical that was, or at least how critical I always felt it was, when I first started collecting, I went out of my way to get every single book that everybody made. I signed up for every single newsletter and uh, or group, collector group that I could join so I could get stuff. And I remember years ago, many, many years ago, when I first got started with this stuff, running around at a flea market. I was talking to an antique dealer and asking her if she had any Boy Scout or Girl Scout stuff. And she said, I have a pin that I know is Girl Scout. But some previous collector came here who was really rude and told me it definitely wasn't. And if you want it, you can have it for $10. Okay, I, I went, I looked at it. And it didn't have any Girl Scout markings on it, but I had seen that before in an early edition of the old Scout Collect Quarterly magazine. And what it was, it was the first type Girl Scout Golden Eaglet pin. Again, didn't have the typical Girl Scout logo on it. It was this weird looking eagle with a little GS fancy design into it, but I knew what it was. So I grabbed it. And a few months later, I actually had a friend who was very much into Girl Scout collecting back then, and he had an Eagle medal that when I flipped it over and I told him what it was, it's like, oh, I know somebody that's looking for that. And I said, whoa, if you want to get rid of it, I'd love it. And I know you were drooling over that Girl Scout golden eagle that I had. And he said, do you want to do a swap? And he, said, he was thinking about it. And he said, sure. And back then, that couldn't have been a, a, as fair a swap as you could have done. The very first Gold, Girl Scout Golden Eagle Eagle Award for the, for the very first Boy Scout Eagle Medal. Now, again, if you look at it today, that Eagle Medal is worth literally thousands of dollars compared to as much as the way it's appreciated compared to the way the Girl Scout Golden Eagle appreciated. But back then, nobody, nobody had the eaglets. And when you think about it, that was taking a $10 purchase strictly because I knew what it was with where a previous collector had run by it and didn't do the research and didn't know what it was and was able to turn around and have a, one of the primo pieces in my collection. So it's so, so critical for for collectors to be educated. It's so, so important for people to share information and try to put it down in articles and in writing books and putting some of that research material together because over the years, we're going to lose the history if we don't. Well, Mitch, thanks so much for coming on, being my guest on Scouting Hot Finds Radio. I think that I do have all the editions of your book and I can't wait to get the fifth edition in the mail. I've already sent you the money. So, yep. uh, I'm again, MitchReese.com. You've already given us that uh, spelling. So we will, I'll put it in the show notes and make sure that everybody knows where to go find it. Thank yep. you so much for coming on. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me.